Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Digitally Uploaded Podcast, the companion podcast to digitallydownloaded.net. I'm Matt, and I am going to be your host today because Alan's off in Fairyland. And this week with us, we have another Matt. Hello, other Matt. Hello, first Matt. Matt from shindig.nz. I should probably give you a call out. I, I probably should have been doing that like every month <laughs> since you've been on this podcast. But if you want to read a lot of Matt's really good quality writing, go and check out shindig.nz now on Metacritic. And he's got a review up there of Feta Morgana, which I read just this morning before this podcast. It was a good review, Matt. Thank you. Very good review of a very good game. Now it, it is, is, it is what, six, six Metacritic ratings, all 100. It's uh, the perfect we'll, game. We'll, we'll be with Metacritic updates, but I think <laughs> it's the Paddington Bear Two of video games. That's exactly it. That <laughs> yeah, exactly. and for the same audience. <laughs> <laughs> exactly the same audience too. I'm sure the crossover between fans of Fata Morgana and yeah, fans exactly. of Paddington Bear Two will be Explore very. Cool. a lot of the same themes as well. I think. <laughs> exactly. For people who maybe are tuning into this podcast and don't know about that little story, this week there was the fun news that um, Citizen Kane has been dumped off the top of the Metacritic, or Rotten Tomatoes, actually. Rotten Tomatoes ratings, it was 100%, but they found an 80-year-old review or something, which um, was negative, so that dropped it down to 99%, and there is one 100% film left, and that is Paddington 2. So, yeah, the best film of all time, and Face of Morgana is the best game of all time, thanks to people like Matt. Moving on, we also have Harvard. Hello, Harvard. Hello, hello. And we have Trent. Hello, Trent. Hello. Cool. We're all here. We're all here and present and accounted for. So we're going to listen to some wonderful tunes from Hatsune Miku. And then we're going to come back and talk about the games that are coming out over the next month.
And welcome back. Okie dokie. So, as we usually do with this podcast, or as we always do with this podcast, we're going to spend the first section running through the games that are coming out in May. And there's there's not too many of them, but there is a few that you're going to want to pay attention to, I think. So, first up, we have on the PlayStation 5, the two games per month that are releasing on PlayStation 5 at the moment. First up, we've got Wreckfest. That's like a car racing thing, isn't it? That's destruction derby like. Yeah. yeah. So that's fun. I I actually um I spent a lot of time playing Destruction Derby back in the day on the PlayStation One because it was one of the few games that had a decent demo. <laughs> um I don't think I ever played the full game, just the demo. But yeah, it was good fun. So breakfast. We also have on May seven Resident Evil Village. I think people are looking forward to that. I assume. Some people out there are. It's got mercenaries mode and zombie women and stuff the demo was popular um then we've got hood outlaws and legends comes out on the same day well that was a mistake um i think hood's like a multiplayer online thing isn't it where one person or a group of people play as robin hood and then another group of people play as the sheriff of nottingham or something <laughs> uh but it is a purely pvp pve game so if you're into your online things i think that's probably pitching at the same place as what was that ubisoft one um the rainbow six no 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 the medieval knights versus uh for honor for honor for, 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 for honor yeah for honor that's the one yeah so i think hood's pitching at about the same place as for honor then pretty- on may 14 we've got subnautica below zero i think that's pretty well received isn't it that's or at least the last one was. Uh, May 18, we've got Void Terrarium, which was already released on the PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch. It's a little roguelike thing, which is actually very high quality. I don't know what PlayStation 5 is going to bring, because it wasn't exactly a you know, a hardware-pushing game, but that is coming out on May 18. And then May 20, we've got the Amer- Amazing American Circus, which I don't know anything about, but in theory, it could be good, I guess. Circus is a good fun. I like Cirque du Soleil. So I want to imagine that the game is somehow that. On PlayStation 4, there's more stuff, because you can obviously play on PlayStation 5 as well. Um, And developers are still taking advantage of that. On May 4, there's a game called The Colonist coming out. That's a city builder civilization thing where you play as cute little robots. That looks pretty fun. Then we've got Skate City coming out on May 6th, which I imagine is pitching to the Tony Hawk fan crowd. We've also got Hood and Resident Evil Village coming out on the PlayStation 4 as well. So if you don't have a PS5 yet, you're not missing out on those games. On May 14, we have Mass Effect Legendary Edition, which is the HD version of the first three Mass Effect games when Mass Effect was still worth playing. And that'll be pretty good, I think. I'll definitely be dipping into that to play those again. I especially liked Mass Effect 3, actually. That was my thing. Um, You're going to make everyone angry again. Yes, I am. I am definitely when I go out and defend the ending of Mass Effect because nobody played that game right and nobody good. knows how to read a story. Um, sorry? What was that? I said, I said good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one, that one's going to be fun. On May 18, there's a leisure, a leisure Suit Larry game coming out. So, cool. Why? Why? I don't know. Why? Why not? <laughs> Give me one good reason not to put out a no. Leisure Suit Larry game, Matt. Have they, have they ever been good? No. I, I think you're missing the point if you expect a game to be good. That's true. All games are bad. <laughs> That's right. On May 20, Jay and Silent Bob Mall Brawl. So if for some reason you're still a fan (laughs) of Jay and Silent Bob, there you go. you got a brawler coming. I don't know why. I mean, that's that's an old thing, is Jay and Silent Bob. I've never heard of that. I I swear you just made that up. What, the game or Jay and Silent Bob? What's Jay and Silent Bob? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) You have to be old like like, like the Mets. Damn Gen Z. (laughs) <laughs> I don't even know. Mate, you're, you're, you're young, innocent brain. 
Uh, all these Gen Zs, these Zoomers, they don't know anything anymore. Jane Silent Bob, Jane and Silent Bob was like uh, what Matt and I grew up with. Um, yeah. As kind of edgy, edgy humor. Go watch Chasing Amy. Actually, don't watch it because it's not a very good film, but that's, yeah. I mean, they had their own movies, but they were also in movies like Chasing Amy and Dogma and stuff. So they're, they're just characters in a film series. Um, that's basically a stoner road trip movie. Yeah, that's that's it. Ah, uh, yes. Dude, first we, the dude, cat. Wears my, we, dude wears my car kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then they take that character and put it into a whole lot of other films by that director, Kevin Smith. Sounds very alien to me. Yeah, it should be. <laughs> it's probably left in the kind of millennial humor category. And <laughs> yeah. Nobody else ever needs to watch that. Moving on. Rust comes out on May 21. Rust Console Edition. That's that oh, that's survival way. game that was controversial for reasons that were pretty silly at the time. And who knows? Uh, I think it's a, it built up a pretty good audience in the years since it first released on PC. So that's it's why they're doing a console version. It's extremely toxic, so I don't know how it's going to turn out. On oh, PS4. it's still toxic. Okay, it's yeah. it's just such a it's such a neoliberal game in that the ideology is that just like kill everyone, get yourself rich, right? It's a very very like, hostile environment. Sounds like most video games, to be honest. No, but like especially hostile. <laughs> um, on on May twenty five, there's a game called Bio Mutant coming out. Biomutant is an open-world post-apocalyptic kung fu fable RPG with a unique martial arts style combat system. So that's just a word salad. Um, and it's got like a mutated cat on the cover with a weapon. Anyway, that's coming out on May 25 if you're interested in open-world post-apocalyptic kung fu fable RPGs. On May 25, we've got King of Seas coming out. That's an action role-playing game set in a procedural pirate world. So, roguelike. It's a roguelike pirate game coming out on May 25. On May 25 as well, there's Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne HD Remaster, which I have been playing and can confirm it is a very good game. Remade very nicely. If you like your brutally dark RPGs, that one is for you. How many times on, have you been body wiped? Oh, well, constantly. I've lost count. Uh, on May 27, Earth Defense Force World Brothers comes out. Now, that is a cute little blocky version of Earth Defense Force, which looks really adorable and very entertaining. It's been far too long since the last EDF, and I'm very much looking forward to playing that when it comes out. On May 27, we've got Warhammer Age of Sigma Stormground which I don't know much about because I never played the tabletop um, Age of Sigma, but there you go. That's coming out. Should be Warhammer-like. On May 28, there's a game called Song of Horror coming out on console. Now, I did write a preview or just a news article when they announced that it was coming out. I think it was about a week ago now. And it looks really good. It's a stalker horror thing that was originally released on PC in episodic format. It's coming to the console with all the episodes in one go, and it looks pretty intense as a horror thing. So if Resident Evil isn't your thing, but you still like horror games, then you have one to look forward to at the end of May. Right, moving on to Nintendo Switch, where all the crap gets released. The amount of shovelware that you have to walk through, wade through to get to the good games on the Switch now is ridiculous. Uh, May 6, a game called Cyberhive comes out, a strategic space travel simulator with a non-linear story in the cosmic opera setting and an anime visual style. So if Alan was here, his ears would be burning. But there you go. Actually, that's nothing compared to the next one I'm going to mention. Poker Pretty Girls Battle Fantasy World Edition. That is coming out on Switch on May 6. It is a sexy poker game, which, which with anime characters. So that, In my that, notebook, I've literally just written poker sex. <laughs> poker sex. It's, um, it's going it, to get a 5 out of 5 from me. So It's see. like Pokemon, but sex. you got to collect them all. <laughs> no, there's, no, been no. A, there's been a lot of these recently where it's just like a match three game, but there's fan servers in it. Yeah, there's a company, East Asia Soft, is porting a lot of them to the Switch. And 
finding an audience doing so, so good on them. You can get your sexy on the train while you're commuting, <laughs> playing sexy poker and hoping nobody watches. Um, moving on. Subnautica comes out on Switch as well. as uh, both Subnautica, Subnautica Below Zero, and a pack of the two of them. That's on May 14. That's a real, I thought it was on the Switch already moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the game that you hear enough about that you assume it's already on everything, but it hasn't been on Switch, so there you go. So the first big release for the Switch comes on May 14. That is Famicom Detective Club. There are two games in that, so if you buy them, you're, you're getting two different games. And I have been playing them for preview, and they are very good. They're kind of a detective vision novel thing, and yeah, you, you definitely want to keep an eye out for those. It's amazing that Nintendo... The remakes of a Nintendo uh, Entertainment System and NES game from 1988, and they've never been released in English before. Nintendo is actually localizing them for the first time, and they're one of Nintendo's lesser-known properties, so you'll get your chance to play those this month. Leisure Suit Larry is also coming out on Switch 2. If you want to play Leisure Suit Larry on on the go, you can do that. The Amazing American Circus is also coming out on Switch next month, so cool. Miitopia is also coming out in May, on May 21. That's another Nintendo game. I never played Miitopia. That was a 3DS thing, right? It's meant to be this like wacky RPG where your friends are your party members, I think. Right, there you go. So, using Miis as your characters. Yeah, I mean, Nintendo is very weird with their knees. Every now and, and then they're like, they're gone, they're back, they're gone, they're back. <laughs> and everyone likes it right now because they're the most detailed knees have been for like a long time. And everyone's making like weird meme stuff with memes. Yeah, but even detailed memes are still ugliest. And so. <laughs> <laughs> I hate them so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you have a whole world of them. They're still better than pop caps. A pop, uh, pop vinyls, pop pop, yeah. Yeah, but that's basically everything's better than those, Trent. <clears throat> um, so also on the Switch on May 25, Man Eater for some reason, I don't know why. I don't think it sold that well. I don't know why they I'm, keep porting it to everything else. But I if you like to play Killer Shark, play. there you go, Man Eater's out on May 25. Also on May 25, Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne is coming out on the Switch as well. That's probably the place you want to play it. Be able to play it on the go. The Switch is also getting Earth Defense Force World Brothers. That's the first time an ADF game has been on the Switch. There is also going to be Warhammer Age of Sigma on the Switch on May 27. Horse Club Adventures comes out on May 27. If you like your horse riding, you'll be able to play that. That's going to be the game of the month, I'm sure. Um, World's End Club comes out on May 28. Nippon Ichi is localizing that one. I think it was a mobile game, was it? First. And they've picked that up. It sounds so familiar. What's the premise? I don't know. Um, That's the one from the <laughs> Danganronpa and Ah. Uh, oh. That reward. The kind of team up, team up thing. Oh. Right, so that suddenly gets my interest a lot more. <laughs> the Dengen Rumper writer is back. So there we go. I'll play that. And uh, that's basically it for the month. So not a huge number of games, but more than enough to keep you busy anyway. We'll start with Trent. Trent, you get to pick one game. Tell us which one, if you could only play one game this month, which one would it be? I think I'm going to end up buying Resident Evil. Or Metopia, one of them. That's quite a difference. That is very different. I mean, <laughs> scary in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's true. They are both horror games, I guess, in a way. <laughs> um, Harvard, what about you? You get to pick one game. Oh, man. This is a real backlog month for me, I think. If anything for this month, maybe Mass Effect series, just because I've actually never played them. So I feel like I need to go back and figure out what the hubbub is about. Yeah, you should probably play them once. I mean, they were back when Bioware was good before EA managed to screw them up. So 
Yeah, and they're real hard to access, but everyone keeps referencing them, so I feel like now is the time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You can only play them on last kind of um, legacy hardware at the moment, so I do think it was the right idea to do that trilogy. Would have been nice to have it on the Switch as well. It would have been really nice, but I'll play it on PS5. Uh, Matt, what about you? Uh, uh, there's so many choices. Um, I think I'm going with World at World's End Club. Um, just the I think the the combination of Dungan Rampa writer and Virtue's Last Reward writer in like a weird weird is not the right word, but sort of post apocalyptic post apocalyptic platformer ish adventure game type of thing about a group of kids who have been stranded somewhere trying to make their way back home to Tokyo. Sounds very interesting. Um, yeah. It could be quirky, is what you're saying. Yeah. Quirky is the right <laughs> word. Quirky. I do like quirky. That's my that's it's, my word. Yeah. It looks... It's the kind of thing that looks, from the outside, like it might be quite wholesome, but you know it's not going to be, just because of who's involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and that is appealing. I'm sure it's going to be really quite the mind bleep, which would be good. Um, as for me, I'm going to, I mean, most people would probably assume I'd say Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. I do care about that game a great deal, but I'm actually going to say Famicom Detective Club is my pick for the month because I am that invested in those games. I really, really hope that it works for Nintendo because... Those are great. <laughs> I'm not sure how it's going to go because I, I do think most people are going to see them as just visual novels without much interaction. But then again, Fate and Morgana with that 100 on Metacritic, maybe people are turning around on, on visual novels. <laughs> <laughs> maybe there is chance for Famicom Detective Club yet. All right, so we're going to go to some music. I'm going to throw the... DJ table, whatever they call it, to Trent to pick a song. How are the turntables? I know. What are we going to pick? Let's pick. Oh, let's pick something scary out of Resident Evil. Yes. Resident Evil has music. I, I, I assume so, does it? From a movie. Sure, that's from a movie. I think Alan will pick the save music. Uh, save, oh, save. the save music. <laughs> The one time you feel safe in a Resident Evil game. Yep, okay, so Resident Evil save music. And welcome back, everybody. Right, so we're going to talk about roguelikes this week to start with, um, because a big one got released uh, last week as we record this, Returnal, and it has kicked off debate. Admittedly, not too much debate about the actual roguelike stuff. <laughs> um, the conversations that are happening around Returnal are related to other things, and not all of it is very pleasant. We're not going to go over it in the podcast, but... It is a roguelike, and it is an incredibly difficult game, in part because of its roguelike uh, qualities. And I know that you're not the world's biggest fan of what they've done with that, Matt. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Sexual. Um, I mean, it's yeah. a good game. I mean, I think we both we we all acknowledge that it's uh, it plays nicely, and it has plenty of qualities which are good. But I think. 
you definitely sit on the lower end of the Metacritic ratings for the game, and yeah. I'm, I'm below the average as well. I think, for me, and I like roguelikes like, quite a lot. I never used to, but I've come around to them in the last few years and have learned to really appreciate kind of what they do. And the, I think you, we were talking about this in the chat and you said they are, by design, inherently unfair as a thing. And that is just, yeah. Um, but there is, when they're made well, that unfairness is fun and yeah. interesting yeah. and part of what um, makes them worth playing. And I think a good roguelike makes you want to keep coming back to it despite being unfair. Um, Returnal doesn't. I think Returnal is a game that, for lots of various reasons that I don't need to get into too much detail, it's, for me, a game where you die lots and often suddenly and often randomly and often for reasons beyond your control, which are all roguelike things, but in Returnal, when you do that, or I, it makes me just not want to come back, which is different to most other roguelikes where you, you die that was a wild ride. Okay, let me try again because that was a lot of fun. Um, and I think an important thing is as much as you're going to die feeling like there was some value in that in whatever way that may be, maybe it's, you know, rogue lights kind of thing with permanent progression system. Maybe it's sort of the story unfolding through each death in the way that Hades does it. Um, Maybe it's just kind of getting a better understanding of the game system and systems and how they all piece together, uh, or even just you know going back to Rogue itself, thinking about you know the way items work and how different combinations of I of items and equipment and the can make can change the way you actually play the game and approach it in, in such a drastic fashion that. Uh, even when you're dying, just experimenting with all those options is its own kind of reward. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, a roguelike is a good kind of loop where after you die, you feel like the next time you give it a go, you've got a better than zero chance of making it through, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. that you get to... Well, let's say we're playing one of the mystery dungeon games, for example, and you get to level six of the tower before some monster comes out and wallops you. The For me, the replay value is in knowing the next time I get to that level six of the tower through a combination of being better familiar with the, ga with the game and the, the way its difficulty works and the luck of the drawer and all those kinds of things, knowing that that next time that I get to that level six of the tower, I will be able to progress or at least have a good chance of progressing past that. For me, the problem I had with Returnal, and it really did try my patience and my willingness to play the game. If I wasn't reviewing it, I probably would have given up a lot earlier on than I did. But with with Returnal, I hit walls constantly and I would get to a boss, it was usually a boss, and I would get walloped big time within seconds and I would be left thinking, I'm going to have that same experience the next time I get to that boss <laughs> and the next time and the next time. I'm not going to make progress through this boss anytime soon. And that becomes kind of claustrophobic. It becomes very difficult to want to play when you know that you're in for a long ride before you make any progress between be, be, beyond that bit that you got stuck at. So I feel like that was where um, Returnal lost me a bit. In terms of the difficulty, I'm not. I'm a big fan of difficult games. Uh, you and I have talked plenty of them about Neo and Dark Souls and whatever. And those games for me are much more fair. I get to a boss in Neo, he's probably going to wipe the floor with me the first time, but I'm going to walk away from that with a sense that okay, the next time I'm probably going to get a little bit further into defeating this boss. And while that's not a roguelike, I think that that's a better approach to difficulty. Mm. And I think. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, so I, I think um, Returnal's bosses kind of work like that. And it was, I think one of the things I enjoyed most about Returnal 
with the boss fights and they're kind of I I mean granted I like bullet hells a lot as well but the complexity of them and the spectacle and that kind of through kind of practice and trial and error figuring out the exact way to deal with every different thing that it throws at you um that process is a lot of fun and really rewarding but less so when every failure comes with spending at least 15 minutes if you're rushing more like half an hour to an hour if you want to like actually get enough gear to stand a chance um i think it and I th that one for me was one of the most frustrating things about returnal is the way the roguelike stuff detracted from what i most enjoyed about everything else about it yeah i mean i i actually enjoyed the the pro progress i think i think we're kind of looking at it from <laughs> different angles it, it was funny reading your review against mine we we have kind of opposite opinions but in a way that were kind of, is kind of complementary but i um I, I like the journey to the bosses and I certainly thought that the bosses were spectacles that were interesting. And if I had a better chance at defeating those bosses, I would have probably enjoyed them more, but I ended up being quite intimidated, intimidated by them because there were times where I would be getting up to this boss and ninth or 10th time. And I'd be like, I still really don't understand how to beat this boss. It didn't help that a lot of the boss fights were kind of um, bullet hell in nature and I'm terrible at bullet hells. So that certainly didn't help me either. But yeah, I, I definitely hit walls, like actual walls, where there there was just I had no sense of how I was going to get past that part of the game. It's a third person shooter, right? Yes. Like, so is it very skill intensive? Like is it very intensive with dexterity, or is it more about the loot and the equipment? Oh no, it, it it's definitely skill based. Uh, it, like I said, it, it especially the bosses they have this bullet hell feel to them where the screen will be filled with projectiles and you need to be able to maneuver around, find cover um, and avoid them as much. It, it focuses on a lot of mobility. You do need to move around the space a lot if you're going to defeat the bosses, especially. Uh, so it's certainly not a stand and deliver slow paced shooter. And... I remember reading this article, which was saying that the rogue like design philosophy is actually completely at odds with skill-based gameplay because you want to use your ingenuity and your planning and your exploration to get past obstacles and roguelikes, whereas skill-based games, you kind of just like try to climb a tree with your skill, right? So they used um, Enter the Gungeon as an example, which in that game, the rogue lights mechanics don't really matter because you should just be good enough at shooting and dodging to beat the game with whatever the game gives you. And those two spheres of the game, the randomness and the uh, combat, actually go against each other. So I was wondering if that similar thing is happening with Returnal. Matt might, might disagree. I think definitely it is. It's a... Um, yeah, skill is the most the main thing. There's not... With the random stuff and the way upgrades and things work, there's not that much variety in how they actually influence how you play the game. Mm -hmm. Essentially, your option, you don't really have uh, options for different builds um, and too much scope to let what you've just happened to find and pick up uh, create new opportunities for solving things. It's You pick up things that make you do more damage and take less damage. Um, and so that gives you more, depending on what you find, it's easier to, gives you more uh, room for error, I guess, in, in the skill-based gameplay, but nothing that really changes how you approach what the game's throwing at you. Oh, yeah, I mean, really bad. For, for <laughs> me, the, the biggest the biggest randomization element was uh, I, that I felt anyway as I was playing was more to do with the actual levels yeah. um, and the progress that you take to get to the boss that level that was fairly that did feel fairly randomized so that each time you were trying to do a run the experience would be fundamentally different and that that worked for me i thought that was fine um yeah. I, I didn't have an issue with the procedural levels in the game i thought that they i think they encourage exploration really well mm, yeah uh, especially when you there's like a kind of a light 
Metroid-ish touch with some of the permanent upgrades that thankfully are not, you don't lose them every, every time you die, but like a part way through you get a grappling hook, which means that um, there are places that you can access that you couldn't before. Uh, ah yes, so it's a Metroidvania. It sounds like uh, just adding every quality into this game now. It's a, it's a uh, roguelite, yeah. Metroidvania, third-person uh, shooter. It's a, it's a roguelike, Metroidvania, third-person shooter, bullet hell, survival oh. horror. <laughs> yeah, <Gamers>. with, <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a Souls-like attitude to boss battles. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm in so much pain. <laughs> I mean, it, once again, we're, we're critical of it, but... There's so much to actually admire about Returnal. Yeah. Um, it is right on the cusp of being a genuine classic, I felt. Um, it just... I, I think for me, I would rather it have not been a, uh, a roguelike at all, I think. I think if they had have been gone with kind of you know, human design levels in the same way that the Souls games were, I, I think they would have had a little bit more control over the experience. Mm. And I think that's the thing. That from from a game development perspective, I understand why a lot of developers, especially indie developers, work with roguelikes because that is in a very easy way to fill your game with content um, without having to have you know entire teams working on level design and stuff. But the problem is you are ceding a lot of control over the experience to a bunch of random number generators and if you're not really careful about that, then you can lose kind of control over the in, the entire game. I felt like Hades was a great example of a developer working with the roguelike system, but still keeping control over the experience so that it felt cohesive. It felt like there was a continuity to it. So each time you replayed, it was still building on what you were, had already experienced. So... But, but that's hard. I think that's really hard. A lot of developers just throw procedural generation in there as a way of getting content out of the game. And I feel like Returnal did that a little bit. It's obviously a AAA you know, blockbuster game with a lot of resources behind it. But I still feel like the developers use this random stuff to hide the fact that they didn't have the resources to build all of this stuff themselves, if that makes sense. Do you think it's cheaper to, to randomly generate now that compared to traditionally designed levels? Traditionally designed levels require level designers. <laughs> you actually have to have human talent uh, fix, you know, focused on that stuff. So, And it needs to be built into the whole game. You need to have them on board from the start to, to be working with the art designers and the narrative writers and all that stuff. Le- level design is definitely a... Um, a resource that you you need to do properly. I feel like with roguelikes, it is it is a cheaper option because the systems are already there. Uh, the understanding on how to do procedural generation in video games is already there. You obviously have to make it work uh, and then turn it into your own thing. But I feel I, I do feel like the reason it has been such a popular option at indies is that it allows indies to produce games that have the same length as full kind of projects without having to resource uh, to the same level. Anyway, that's just my random thoughts. <laughs> I think my, proce- I mean, my procedurally generated thoughts. Um, <laughs> procedural, procedurally generated games still require... Those, those, those an, thoughts an, weren't pad out an, enough. Yeah. It still led to awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they still require someone to d- design the components and you can see the difference the difference is really stuck between a rogue like with where with good level design and the pieces that are being randomly put together and one that isn't um but yeah i think probably overall i think more just straightforward level design is a a more complex uh, I, don't know, I don't know if more complex is the right word but requires more time investment and in, in actually figuring out how the, the overall like end-to-end thing all fits together 
I mean, in, in an ideal world, if you're going to do level design, then you want to, and I hate to keep referencing that because it's kind of the, the thing you're not meant to reference anymore, but if you are going to do level design, you want to do something like a, a Souls-like game, or mm. a Dark Souls game, where the, the level itself is a character, it's a personality within the game, and it's telling story, it's actively telling story as you play through it, the the intricacies of the way that you move around the space has meaning and the, there's kind of a whole philosophy behind what the level is actually saying and doing which you want to implement into the game if you're going to go down the level design route then you actually need to think about it and that's 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 a, a, that's a degree of talent that is, is pretty rare in video games mm. um, you can't do any of that with procedural generation there's just no way you can actually tell a story through the level design itself in those games. For a good example, I mean, I think Hades is a masterfully done roguelike. And I do think that the design elements that they put into the game really work. They they carefully considered how the procedural generation would affect the way that you move through the levels and so on. But the levels themselves in um, in Hades weren't carrying too much weight in terms of the experience i feel like everything that was going on within them and the narrative elements that would pop in and out um was really where that game's personality came from but in terms of the the movement through the world because the developers didn't have control over exactly what you were going to see they couldn't predict it therefore they couldn't write it into the experience as such Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's true but, Do you think um, there'll be a point um, where oh, things sorry. are procedurally generated enough that, like, I don't know, maybe like there's enough data in both the narrative, like maybe a procedurally generated narrative and level design, which would somewhat trick your mind into thinking it's more seamless? Yeah? Well, I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, procedurally generating narrative is is something that won't happen until AI gets to a really advanced state to actually write things on the fly. Well, um, less so much written stuff, but more like um, the level design has more uh, environmental narrative storytelling. Maybe that, like, to make it seem like, okay, well, the narrative is lending itself to this element in the level, and then it seems like it's seamless and it, was intended. It, it would be still very difficult to do because, I mean, to think about it in a really reductionist sense, right? If you have random elements, then it also means that there's the chance that a player won't experience something when they go through the game at that point. So if, for example, there was this room that you've designed um, to pop in and out, um, you know, one of the, the random mix. So as you're playing through, you could encounter this room. If you don't encounter it, the experience still needs to be the same. So if you write the narrative into the random elements, then... How do you account for what happens if the player doesn't experience those narrative elements? So as a result, when there is randomization in the the way that a story works in roguelikes, it tends to be quite shallow because you still need to have a complete experience if you don't experience that little cut of narrative. Um, I, I don't think... Personally, I don't think that randomization works in narrative because I think that the creators behind a game need to understand what their players are experiencing to some level um and they need to have that level of certainty in order to to make each part of the narrative important to the experience but with that being said i mean i'm certainly not against roguelikes i think roguelikes are a great genre i really enjoy um mystery dungeon games i enjoyed 90 percent of (laughs) returnal uh outside of the difficulty of the the boss battles and stuff um I think roguelikes are great. I just think that they have certain weaknesses that developers should probably be a little bit more aware of. <laughs> um, they sometimes they're good at what they do, but exactly. what they do isn't a, a good fit for every game. Um, and I think the popularity of them, there is a risk of it just becoming the thing to do without really thinking about why. Yeah, it's like open worlds, right? Um, and I think we even talked about that in a podcast a while back that like the big developers do open worlds almost by default now because that's the thing you do 
indies do roguelikes almost by default because that's the thing you do. You end up with a million different rogue games claiming to be a roguelike. I would uh, argue even when it doesn't always fit. Farming simulators by default right now. <laughs> uh, um, that's becoming it as well. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's the thing. Can't you wait can't to play just an open world roguelike farming simulator. Yeah. <laughs> you you can't just kind of shove squares into circular holes or whatever not every game needs to be a, a open world game not every game benefits from being an open world game i think it's the same with roguelikes not every game idea benefits from procedural generation all right on that note we're going to go to a break we're going to listen to some music from whatever harvard's going to say and then we're going to come back and talk about something else so harvard uh the enter the gungeon theme song Enter the Gungeon theme song. Everyone should play that game. It's a good game. Radio, we are back. So we're going to be talking about a, another genre for this section, the sim genre. And we're talking about this because Trent wanted to. <laughs> That's basically Choking how it, it all on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, 
what what did you want to talk about here, Trent? What was what was it about the sim, uh, was the sim genre that piqued your interest this week? Piqued my interest. Well, um, the the announcement of that new zoo game that was pretty cool, and I'm like, you know, that gives me some nostalgia for the days of you know theme park, theme hospital, all that sort of stuff, and it was in my mind that you know if if people are making those games again, let's talk about them. <laughs> There's a Sim Zoo game that was announced. I didn't. Yeah, um, yes. by No um, More Robots. Ah, oh, okay, cool. That's pretty That's neat. Cool. Because uh, Zoo Tycoon never really took off, even though the first one was pretty good. Yeah, that was the thing. I mean, I, I always liked the. I personally liked the Zoo Tycoon games, but they weren't huge. Um, not like Ra- Roller Coaster Tycoon or whatever, but. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a there was a zoo game, uh, a zoo simulator that was produced Planet fairly zoo. recently, wasn't it? Planet, Planet, Planet zoo. zoo. You played that, didn't you, Matt? Yeah, I did. Was it good? That's good. It's uh, you have to invest a lot of time into understanding all the how it all works, but once you do that, it's really good. It's basically Planet Coaster, but for zoos. That's so it's that same kind of very. Uh, focused on the on the complex end of it and the freedom that comes with that complexity, but the learning curve that comes with it as well. Can I ask with these games, is your preference to play it as like an actual job manager, be the best zoo maker you can, or do you just go off the rails and do crazy stuff? Well, I imagine Trent, Trent would be going off doing crazy stuff, right, yeah. Trent? Oh yes, yeah, definitely. I, I, I like the management side of things, don't get me wrong. And yeah. but I these sort of be games like animal. even Sim City, I like to do the money cheats and just do just stuff. <laughs> I wouldn't no, want Sim to be an City's, animal and Sim, 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 Sim City's fun where you put a roll a, 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 a typhoon or a tornado or Bowser to come Bowser. crashing through the city. Yeah, Bowser. Did you never play the Sim City on the uh, the Super Nintendo? No, that game's like impossible to access now because of licensing. <laughs> so SimCity on the Super Nintendo had Bowser as a disaster. That's that's actually hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty cool. He comes smashing through your city and everything had burned down. It it was a it was a nightmare. But yeah, that was good fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, for for me with Sims, I don't know. I, I think I, I I much prefer. I think I I do prefer games that are, are fairly dry i guess in terms of you like the a-train games right you're like one of the three people who likes the a-train games i love a-train and matt likes a-train too right matt second a-train. person who likes the A-train. it's just a thing it's people a-train who have the, who are named matt it's just for yeah. people who are named matt but yeah i like a-train and that was that, I that am game's actually, about as hard a, sorry clone of matt s i am actually just a clone of matt <laughs> i don't know if we've, we've told anyone yet but <laughs> yeah we're, we're all just the same person um, it's the name I'm telling you. Every Matt thinks exactly the same way too. But yeah, A Train's great, and it is kind of the example of a sim game I really enjoy. Where not only are you carefully constructing train lines and um, organizing the schedules so that they're all right on time every minute, but then you also need to deal with the stock, <laughs> the stock market um, for for reasons. And yeah. It's a, uh, it's a very complex game. It takes many hours to get into, but once you get into it, it's pretty rewarding. And I guess I like it because it does capture the essence, I guess, of, of the real world job. And I think that was the thing when when I originally played SimCity, the original. I think it was the second one. Um, was my first SimCity, and I read somewhere that it was actually based on real world city planning. Um, techniques and stuff and i think that was what attracted me to the genre and has kind of continued on since so for me um i wasn't a huge fan of planet coaster which is apparently a controversial thing to say because everyone loves that game but it was it felt a little bit too uh, safe on the simulation side of things is that fair to say matt i don't know um I, I'd agree with like Planet Coaster. I, I'd back you up there. I, like yeah. those more like the roller coasting games. Like I feel they're 
like I want something a little bit more theme parky, and I know that some of them are like theme park with their roller coasters, but I feel like they're just focusing. Like their big thing is you can make roller coasters, and it really turns me off to like not even investigate the game because it's like all about roller coasters and i hate roller coasters in real life so what's the point about playing games with roller coasters <laughs> well for me i think it was that i ended up spending so much time with planet coaster trying to make the the thing pretty because she needed to have like an aesthetic rating so i would be putting all this this junk down on the the pathways up to each ride to to try and make it all pretty and i, I didn't really want to do that i just wanted to manage a theme park and I have the same issue, I think, with also... I mean, I played the Jurassic Park one, which, as a fan of Jurassic Park, should have appealed to me more than it did. Because I think my big problem with these games is it feels like the fail state for them is too abstract. It feels like maybe you can fail in these games. But the idea is not to challenge you with the consequence being a fail if you don't manage a park well. Does that make sense? I feel like I, w- I want my decisions to matter when I'm making these games. And if I make yeah, a bad like decision, I get punished for it. You know, not really an out. In the game, like in real life. Yeah, go bankrupt. Like the earlier SimCity games, especially, if you took out all these loans to build all this great stuff, you'd have a really nice looking city, but then you'd quickly run into money trouble. Um, and then the power would go out and all the Sims would start hating you, so they'd start leaving. It'd be this kind of... Um, this snowballing effect and too many modern simulating games feel a little bit too gentle on that side of things. I think I kind of like the reverse where they, instead of punishing you, if you fail to succeed, there's games that give you monuments or goals that are really difficult to achieve unless you understand the systems well. And so you get your sense of challenge that way. My example is always like roller coaster tycoon where there's always mission, there's always missions and side quests. And some of them are actually really hard to do unless you know the systems of the game really well. Like, you can plan around your park and your roller coasters and your marketing and make everything work together. Then you can achieve that difficult goal that you wouldn't have been able to do, but your park still would have kept going. You just wouldn't have had that gold trophy, you know? See, the thing with um, Roller Coaster Tycoon that always put me off a little bit was the lack of sandbox mode with a lot of them. Um, because that's the <laughs> other thing. Funny story about that. I like sandbox modes in my simulations. I the, I always default to them when I play them. I'm not a big fan of mission stuff in 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 Sims. Uh, Chris Sawyer, the developer behind uh, Rollercoaster Tycoon, hated sandbox mode because he his whole spiel was that you should be playing the game to do missions. And he didn't understand why anyone would want to just build a park for fun. <laughs> <laughs> See, I hate missions because missions are, always feel so shoehorned. Like, they, or they're really stupid things. And, like, in some games where it's like Theme Park or, or not Theme Park, like Theme Hospital, like all the hospital simulated style games, um, where they're like, okay, well, your next one is like you've sold your hospital, you've moved on to the, you know, the new lot, you're going to be the new doctor. That's the end of the story. You might have a few missions in terms of, like, they're the end goals you need to cure x amount of people that sort of thing they're okay but like other ones where it's like more as the get, as levels evolving or more like okay well you know you have to go and do this mission to like build like a particular park infrastructure right now because of reasons or something silly like i don't know i just feel like they're really shoehorned to make you make the park the way they want you to make the park yeah, yeah they design them very carefully so you have some kind of open-ended way to reach that goal but yeah i get what you mean you definitely need to balance that but you mentioned um you, you mentioned the, the the hospital one um the recent release of two point hospital was a good example of what i was talking about earlier that it felt like i couldn't fail when i was playing that game i don't know if i'm just that good at simulations that it I've somehow entered a zone where I just can't screw up when I play, but I don't think so. I think that it just felt like it was just so generous <laughs> that the fail state wasn't really there, not in any kind of meaningful way. And oh, yeah. I love Two Point, but I think Two Point's whole point was nostalgia and being a really smooth, you know, fun, easy to pick up game 
to go, oh, I remember Theme Hospital. I think that was the whole point. There's a few mechanics in it, and that's the thing, but mostly it's like, okay, well, I need x-rays here, or, you know, like, you know, I liked, GPs. I, liked, I, did, I did like the humor of um, Two Point Hospital. I thought it was good fun, but, yeah, it just, it didn't tick the simulation box for me. Um, for me, the, the simulation that I've been coming back to a lot over the last couple of years is uh, Project High Rise which is a sim tower like uh, simulation and it is more than willing to fail you if you aren't <laughs> um, smart about how you spend your money and how you build up your tower so yeah it, it's a very dry looking game it doesn't it doesn't look like much but that's the one that I've been really hooked on over the last couple of years as my kind of go to when I feel like I'm playing when I'm feel like I'm in the mood for a sim game that being said, if they put Sims on Switch, I'd be there in instant for that, I think. How have they not done that yet? The Sims series is weird now, I think. Yes, it is. EA. EA, man, they just can't do anything right. But, yeah, The Sims is... I, I love The Sims. Um, but I, I think I we're due on a for a Sims hill. 5. Like, we're, we're due for one. So... Like, I, I hope once they get to the Sims 5 era and they announce it and they get into the vibe that there's other sort of things. I remember Sims 3 had a lot of them, like Cast Away and um, those sort of style games which were on the um, Switch and other consoles, whereas they weren't the main Sims, but... And, and Herbs, you know, the urban one, you know... <laughs> no, all, all... This, but the Herbs was the, the best game, dude, that was such a good game. It's going to be the Switch one. It'll be a new a new version of Herbs. <laughs> that was just a game where you were a, a millennial and you had no money. You were sleeping <laughs> on like a couch you found out from the street. <laughs> and you were eating food from like a public barbecue because you had no money for a stove. That was a great game. Unfortunately, um, being EA, it would be all like DLC onto a base Sims game now. That is what they did. I, I Yeah, I, I liked all of those kind of little spin-offs they did, but it's quite obvious that EA would only do that via DLC and microtransactions now. Yeah, they figured they figured out what makes money. Yeah, exactly. And if you have a look at how much stuff you can buy for The Sims 4, it's it's insane. It's, it's always been like that. Insane. I remember they would, they would all have these expansion packs, which was nice because you can kind of pick what you liked. Like if you cared about pets, you could get the pets expansion. And if you didn't want magic powers, you just don't buy the magic powers one. But yeah, money. <laughs> Yeah, they're definitely more spread across um, other things, or there's, like, a main pack which does certain things, but if you want, like, you know, like the eco pack, there's a main eco pack, but if you want laundries, like, you have to buy the laundry stuff pack, and it's not an expansion, it's just, like, an extra add-on thing. And then suddenly your Sims are, like, dumping their clothes all over the house, and they don't, like, clean them properly, and then your house is, like, messy. But then you can just go into, like, the editing tool and just delete them all anyway, so... I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just imagining that, just paying money for your, for your digital sims to be bad at doing laundry. <laughs> well, I wanted to build a tiny house. <laughs> That's what I like uh, to do. I like to, I, I like to shove my sims into like super small houses where they have no money and that's it. I, I never get them good jobs or anything. They just scratch for a living. Um, no, it's it's very cheats, simulation game. Don't even play the actual Sims part. It's all about the building the houses, maybe running them through the house a bit, but building the house. You don't need anything else. And then you fill it with all the really cheap furniture and stuff, and it's always breaking down, so they always have to repair it. That's always good fun. And then they're sad because they have like bad furniture or bad like pictures and stuff on the wall because they need to have like perfect like landscapes or whatever the sim rating is for that. And That's then you for, then you forget to lock right you forget to lock the door so people just show up to your house at like three o'clock in the morning, come barging in, put the music on, and start rocking out while you're trying to <laughs> your Sims Sims are trying to sleep. It's a pretty funny game. The Sims is great. It's a, a the funny thing actually, you know, on a more serious note, it amazes me that nobody has done a Sims like oh. Kind of there's there's a few rival. indie sort of stuff which is coming been coming out in the past few years where they're making like housing style games, but they haven't really released. So well, no, it's more about the yeah. the life the life stuff like the sim because you know EA screwed up um, SimCity so 
the developer, I can't remember which developer it was, came along and made City Skylines to, to you know, um, to save SimCity as such. Oh, yeah, and EA screwed up on the roller coaster reboot a billion times, so... Well, I mean, EA has Theme Park, they let that die, uh, and Roller Coaster Tycoon is Atari, and Atari is terrible as well. So along came somebody to make Project Coaster, right? Um, the Zoo Tycoon games didn't do very well. I don't even know who actually made those, but they're not being made anymore. So somebody came along and made the new Zoo ones. And I'm just wondering why nobody has taken a crack at doing a Sims when people are not necessarily happy with what EA did with The Sims 4. And I, I just feel like there would be a space there for some other developer to do a similar thing with The Sims. I'd certainly play it. That said, though, some indies are making some really cool games. Like you've got that one where it's like the the cult, like you live in a cult, and like you manage the cult. Like that's the that's coming out. And then you've got like um, all these new um, prison architect style games as well. And then you've got uh, that other developers making that uh, tavern simulator game. That could be fun. But there's all like different genres than what they used to be. And yeah, I feel just... like the indie sims have some kind of spin on it, right? There's like the, the Team 17 survivalists, colonists kind of thing. But there's no just standard, you're in a neighborhood, make a person, make a house. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, I would like for an indie to take a crack at that. Just give us a silly little game where we can make a sim that has a dungeon. <laughs> for, I'm sure there's some copyright reason. thing. <laughs> some copyright thing on this. Yeah, it's probably been painted at like crap. Like, yeah, it's probably going to ruin anybody that tries it. But that would be the one thing that I, I would like to see in the sim space, I think. Somebody else do another one of those. For humans, the twist is that the simulation is actually the player. <laughs> All right. We'll um, give that a wrap, shall we? That was a good section. We had a good chat about sims then. Um, we'll go to some music. What's some good music? Does anyone have the original themes, original Sims theme in the head? Oh, right Super now? Nintendo, Super Nintendo Sim City theme. There we go. Never heard that in my life. Well, now you're gonna. Now it's I good am. Stuff. It's good music when Bowser attacks. You could genuinely be lying to me, and I would, I would just take it right now. <laughs> There's no Sim way City. I can prove that Bowser Sim attacks on Sim City. <laughs> Sim City's got me good music. How, how do you not have an emulator, Harvard? Just download an emulator, download the ROM, and play the thing. Yeah, it's Nintendo's it fault for not making it available, so it's totally, it's totally legit as far as I'm concerned.
And we are back. So, for the last section of the podcast this month, we are going to be talking about photos. Mostly because I've been playing Pokemon Snap like crazy, and it's all I can see. It might, the entire world is just a lens to me now. Everywhere I go, I'm just looking <laughs> at everything like it's through a lens, and I just want to take photos of everything. <laughs> you know, the other Pokemon day, I was just walking down the street, and a bird flew in my path, and my first instinct was to take a photo of it. <laughs> Well, when you kids to myself, get why? a proper DSLR camera and stop playing your video games, your life <laughs> is like that all the time anyway. Uh, but seriously, Pokemon Snap, it's excellent. It's so much fun. Uh, I haven't actually got my review up just as we're talking about this because I only got my copy yesterday, but I am deeply engaged in this game's content. Um, it's, it's really good. And we wanted to do this section to talk about kind of games that are focused around photography because there are more of them now. There was one that was released about two weeks ago where you need to run around a forest taking photos of squirrels and stuff. I can't remember oh, what it's that called. Come out? It came out, yeah. I really wanted to play that. I didn't know it came out. And it's got a really lovely art style and it's an indie Pokemon Snap, only real animals kind of thing. Um, and I, I wanted to do this section because I wanted to talk about how good I think photo modes are or games that are based around photos, not photo modes, but games that are photo based around photography. Because when you think about it, photography works a little bit like a... Mechanically, it's not that dissimilar to a shooter, but it's not violent. Therefore, it's actually good, um, is, is basic, my, my kind of theory about this. And I would like to see more games kind of try and do that. I would love to see... Uh, kind of military game but instead of playing as a guy with a gun shooting people you play as like a war, war journalist or something and need to go get you know photos i mean it'd be pretty effective isn't that photos, ugami right. generation though that's another game with photo modes too isn't it yeah or it's a, another game, about game the whole point yeah. is the photo <laughs> yeah i haven't played it yet i, I do i know i need to but i haven't oh played it, 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 it you you're like describing like you know the photos and stuff like that the whole the whole thing is like there's like shrimp yeah. and stuff like that and they're attacking the world but like um the whole thing is like the there's like all this un propaganda that they're like evil and shit like yeah i, I thought it would be like way up your alley <laughs> Look, you like, like i said it. i do you know like it, i need man. to play it but i haven't yet <laughs> <laughs> Do you but know what's yeah, interesting I mean... about Pokemon Snap, though, compared to Umarangi Generation, is that because it's on rails, you get that sense of urgency. Like, if you don't take it right the second, you'll miss it. Whereas I feel like of other photo games, because you can wait around and wait for the perfect shot, it doesn't feel the same as playing a shooter because you don't have that sense of urgency. Yeah, that's a good point. And I do think you're right about that, that a big part of the shooter genre as such is that excitement and that thrill. And recreating that really does require the developers to think about ways to force you to move quickly. And Pokemon Snap does do that. I mean, it's not a really kind of Twitch action game by any means, but it does have that um, that that sense of timing. I mean, to me, it is. Whenever I finish a, le a, le a level in Pokemon Snap, I feel like I feel like I've just gone through a first-person shooter level because I've just been so <laughs> tired. Go left, right, left, right, move. Camera. Yeah, I know. You're constantly looking around, just hoping to get one uh, one good shot. I know it's it's great. Um, I lost my track of thought there. Just want to be playing Pokemon Snap right now. <laughs> yeah, I just want to be playing Pokemon Snap. That's all I want to do now. This is this is my hobby now. Yeah, but. Are there any photo modes in other games that weren't the main appeal, but then became something bigger for you? Do you remember the first one that happened? Well, I think it only really works when it is the focus of the game. I've never played a game where taking photos has been a secondary part of the experience, and they've done it in a way that's been really compelling. The only times I've ever found that photography in games has been engaging is when it has been a central mechanic. That, that's not true. You you always rave about the photo modes and the Horizon Zero Dawn and those kind of Sony's photo modes. Yeah, general. well, I mean, I, not I the actually draw. The game, I draw. I do. Uh, sorry, you're you're right. I I do draw a little bit of a distinction there in that with those ones, the character's not taking the photo, so it, it's more about you as the player stepping back to view the world whereas I mean, it, it's not a mechanic within the game's fiction as such so 
playing around with the photo mode of Ghost of Tsushima or whatever actually takes you out the, out of the game while you're playing with it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think, I, I think that's, that's where I draw the Hunter. distinction. Um, Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter. I yeah, there's a, there's a camera in that game for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's your that's, that's your good. your your little owl buddy that holds the camera. I, I guess oh, we can all agree that the best best Zelda game then must be Wind Waker because Wind Waker had the photo camera. I don't yeah. know. Oh, I'm trying to think what game had the camera. Oh, it's Bioshock. It's Bioshock where they got you to take photos of the enemies to get bonuses. That Actually, you speak a horror. Uh, Project Zero is the best <laughs> as far as horror games and cameras go because that is where the camera is the entire mechanic. And they've used it in a really intelligent way in in, um, in Project Zero because the whole point is that you have to encourage the, the ghost to get close to you to get a good score in those games when you're shooting them to fight them. But the natural impulse in horror is to keep the enemy away from you. So the developers, I mean, the 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 basic principle of Project Zero really works because it, subver- it kind of inverts your natural response in a horror game to force you to play in a different way, and it kind of heightens the fear as a result of that. I really like what they've done with the camera stuff in Project Zero. It's Project a bit Zero unfortunate. Spooky Pokemon Snap. It is. It's spooky Pokemon Snap, but it really works, and it's unfortunate that it's a Nintendo property now because Nintendo doesn't know what to do with Project Zero. <laughs> and it sounds like that, what, when you're describing those mechanics, it sounds like what the original Resident Evils are trying to do, which is while there's a thing coming at you and you're really scared, you're fumbling with controls to try and shoot it and conserve as much ammo as you can. So you're fighting against your instinct of panic by using precise controls. In a sense, I mean, I think Resident Evil still gives you the tools to keep the enemy at arm's length. Um, there was certainly one of the guns, it was the shotgun, wasn't it? Where you had to let the enemy get quite close to you to get a good headshot in. If you think about the entire game being around that, where you're holding the gun up, waiting for the enemy to get into the specific range zone to angle the gun right to hit them um, in the head. That's basically how the entire Project Zero games work, where, again, you're you're standing there with your camera and the ghost is spinning around you and, and whatever, and you actually need to wait for the ghost to get close, close enough to damage you, to do, uh, uh, to take a photo which damages the ghost in return and get a good amount of damage onto the ghost. So, yeah, that was a really neat mechanic. And I think that that's probably... In terms of using the camera as a combat system, I think that's probably the best example I can think of that video games have done. I also kind of like what Kingdom Hearts does with the camera, because in the third game, they realize that the whole draw of the game is to basically go through this big theme park. So they've hidden all those um, symbols, like hidden Mickey symbols everywhere. And you pull out the camera to document that you found them. And your party members will, will make poses whenever they see that they're in the middle of the lens. So it's this nice like celebration of the game's world. It lets you slow down because you remember that there's time to just stop and take a photo or something. And I think that's a good use of it as well. That it is that kind of um, that that way of encouraging to encouraging you to engage with the world as you play. Because to take a photo, you actually have to be looking through the lens at the world itself, and it gives you that moment to just appreciate the space that you're in. I always, uh, another one that I always really liked, it wasn't, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, it wasn't one that you had manual control over, but Final Fantasy XV did some great things with photos as well, because one of the characters that was in your party was mad keen on photography. Oh, that was and, fun, yeah. I remember yeah, that. and as you actually went through the dungeons and whatever, he would be taking photos <laughs> while you were fighting bosses and whatever, rather than being helpful. And then at the end of the day, <laughs> At the end of the day, you get these like this kind of mini album of, of photos that he's taken of moments through your day's adventure. That was a pretty neat touch. I, I remember they really were good that. photos too. And oh, also, he was, he was the he was the party's gunner, so he like shot them with guns and also shot them with cameras. It was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, he was neat. Um, that was a neat game in general. I'm looking forward to that game being revised by the gamers in a couple of generations as a classic, as happens with Final Fantasy games. Oh yeah, people are gonna come around to Final Fantasy XIII first. 
it is happening now. You're definitely seeing that start to happen. People are starting to go, oh, but actually Final Fantasy Thirteen was good. It was. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you're all starting to realise that. <laughs> I mean, 12 only just had its moments, right? So Yeah, the re-releases helped that. With the re-releases, people were like, oh, yeah, actually, that game wasn't as bad as I remember. Uh, it always happens with Final Fantasy. Actually, while we're talking about photo modes, I'm going to put out a... I'm, I'm going to mention the uh, the printer that you can get for the uh, Nintendo Switch, which I picked up last week. So Fujifilm and Nintendo did this little partnership that is tied into Pokemon Snap, where they're one of those instant photo printers that are pocket-sized and you can carry around with you anywhere. You can get kind of specialized Pokemon stickers so that you can print out your favorite Pokemon, and it has the nice little frame and stuff. It is a really neat little printer, and it reminded me of the original Game Boy printer, if anybody was old enough on this podcast to remember that. That, it was, wasn't, a, that wasn't that long ago. That wasn't, that like wasn't that long ago. 22 <laughs> years ago. Well, I, sometimes I forget how long you guys have been playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember how cool it was to print a barcode on that thing. I was around for it. That's the only we need to worry about. Oh, that's right. Alan's Ellen the one who's too Ellen young Ellen. to actually have experienced any of this stuff. But yeah, the, the Game Boy printer, which would print like 16 by 16 pixel photos. And that was pretty cool back in the day. Anyway, this one reminds me of that experience of printing low quality photos, um, well, small resolution photos of your favorite moments while you're playing your video games. And as somebody who has a big library of screenshots to go through i'm going to be doing a lot of printing over the next couple of weeks especially as i start to add all my favorite pokemon in it it's pretty expensive because each print works out at about a dollar a print and oh, it's a polaroid right yeah it's a polaroid technology and um pokemon snap alone has 200 pokemon so if i'm actually going to print out every single pokemon that i meet along the way i'm going to be looking at 200 dollars just off that game and that's the real dlc <laughs> And don't get me started on my photo libraries from Dead or Alive Extreme, because I've got big, <laughs> I've got big libraries of screenshots <laughs> from that game. We weren't going to get you started on that one. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, I can talk about it because Alan's not on the podcast. You see, so Dead or Alive Extreme is a good example of photo modes in games uh, <laughs> that really works because it's a grab your simulator, and yeah, you end up with a lot of screenshots playing that game. Just imagining Alan seething listening to this right now. <laughs> He's going to be so mad when he listens back to this. I don't know. I feel like it's a bit, a bit of a disconnect because it's just essentially clippy mode. <laughs> clippy mode? What's clippy mode? You know, back in the day, you used to turn on no clipping mode and you'd fly around oh. the levels. <laughs> no clipping mode. Yes. <laughs> no clipping mode is pretty fun. I remember flying around D-Dust on Counter-Strike and just being like, hey, this is an interesting angle I've never been in before. Actually, that, yeah. would be, that would be pretty fun if you were to take a first-person shooter, right? And instead of guns, everybody has photos, cameras, and you've got to go around getting, like, shots of people. That would be fun, actually. Why has no one made that? I would so play that. And then, the, the, you know, whoever gets the best photo, and you have the kind of the judging system just like um, in Pokemon Snap, Whoever gets the best framed photo or whatever is the one that wins that round. That'd be pretty good fun. You have to hide and seek and We used to play that out. in real life. Back when everyone had those Sony cyber shots, we used to play like photo tag. Yeah, photo tagging. That'd be good fun. Why have they not made a game like that before? Why have we come up with all these great ideas for games on this podcast and nobody's actually going to listen to them? <laughs> That's free real estate. We should we should become a game publisher as we did in the great Facebook ending of twenty twenty one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. don't give me sound about it. Anyway, <laughs> we'll give this podcast a wrap, I think. Thank you, everybody, for jumping on and chatting. Good to have you on, Matt and Harvard and Trent. Thank you, everybody, Thank you. for listening, as always. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Um, we're going to wrap with some music. Matt can pick it because he hasn't picked the music yet. And we will see you next month.